Good day, YouTubers, and welcome to the third episode in the boating tips. It's been a long time coming. I started this series of three videos last year, and I did two videos. This one's taken a long time. My apologies. I had thought that I'd do some pictures up to visually explain what I was trying to tell you about how to drive a boat in rough seas. Unfortunately, my drawing ability isn't as good as I thought. I played around for a long time before abandoning the idea. I used to be very good at 3D animation, but that takes a lot of time and the software for it is expensive. I don't have access to it through my work anymore, so it is what it is. I couldn't do the drawings that I wanted to a level that made sense. So I changed tack and this is the video that ended up. I hope it's meaningful to you, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you get some good tips out of it. The digital age has provided us with a lot of tools to help make boating safer and much more enjoyable, but unless you know how to use those tools properly, they're not a lot of help. What I hope to do in this episode is to pass on some hints on just how to interpret these things and how to get the most out of them. I'll just start off with some of the basics of talking about what constitutes a wave, just so that we've all got the same idea of what we're talking about. As you can see in the graphic here, the wave length is measured from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave. The wave height is measured from the peak of one wave to the trough in between the two waves. The calm sea level is usually about halfway between the trough and the peak. The wave frequency is not spoken about much. It's the number of wave crests that pass a given point each second. And the higher the frequency, the rougher it is as a general rule of thumb. We'll talk more about that in a minute. This is related to the frequency, but the term you hear more often is a wave period. And that's the time that's required for two consecutive wave crests to pass a given point. The lower the period, the rougher it is. You can never look at just the wave height when assessing conditions. You have to consider the wave height and the wave period. Without both, you've got no idea of what's happening out there. For instance, you can be out in a 1.2 metre swell at a 20 second wave period and you'd be hard put to detect any movement. That is a dead calm sea. But if you go out in that same 1.2 metre swell with a wave period of, say, five seconds, then you're in for a pretty rough ride. A good rule of thumb for waves below about two and a half metres is to take the wave height in feet. So let's look at a wave height of two metres. That's about six and a half feet. So if the wave period is more than double the wave height in feet, so wave period in seconds, double the wave height in feet, we're talking about a two metre wave, which is six and a half feet. So we're looking for a period of 13 seconds or more. So if I've got a wave period of over 13 seconds on a two metre swell, I should be good to go. There's other considerations we'll talk about shortly, but that's your basic rule of thumb. One of the things that can change that is the current. Along the eastern seaboard of Australia, the current usually runs north-south. If you've got a current running from the north to the south and the wind coming out of the south, then we say that the current is against the wind, and that can make the waves stand up a lot more, as you can see in the image that's on the screen at the moment. So if you're heading out in a 1.2 metre swell, which let's convert that to four feet, we need something more than eight second period. So if you're heading out onto a 1.2 metre swell and say a 10 second period, you should be in for some pretty smooth sailing, except if you get a current running against that, that can get pretty rough very quickly. Depending of course on the speed of the current. The other thing you need to consider is that there's always more than one component to the wave height when you get out there. There's the swell, but there's also wind waves. You can have primary, secondary swells, even tertiary swells. The American NOAA GFS forecasting system usually gives the primary combined swell, but then it gives the wind component and the three swell components. Not for every forecast, but where they're available, you get them. What it means to you, though, is you need to consider the wind swell along with the normal swell. So if we're going out with a 
0.8 metre swell with an 8 second period say, we're in for a really good ride. If we add to that a 10 knot wind blowing in the same direction as the swell, it's going to be a little bit worse, but not that bad that you'd really complain about it. You might not even notice it. However, if the wind is blowing in the opposite direction to the swell, or even at a significant angle to it, that's going to change conditions entirely. And depending on the strength of the wind waves, you can get some real washing machine conditions out there with waves coming from all directions. The other thing that influences wind waves is the distance that they've got to operate over and the amount of time that the wind has been blowing for. So the longer the distance the wind has to operate on the surface of the water and the greater the amount of time it has to operate on the surface of the water, the larger the swell that it causes. That's all fairly logical. What surprises some people though is that if we've had a wind blowing out of the east for a day or so, and you go out the next morning and there's no breeze at all, it can still be pretty rough because that wind has been whipping up the seas for 24 hours. It died down during the early morning hours. You've gone out just after it. It is still rough even though that wind stopped blowing. Everyone's got a different tolerance to how rough they like it when they go out in the boat. I used to go out in much rougher conditions than I do nowadays. I prefer a little bit more comfort these days. But the thing to do is to take note of the weather forecast, work out what you think the conditions are, and then take note of what the conditions are actually like when you get out there. That way you'll build an understanding of how they relate together. You've just got to remember to take all the factors into account, which direction the swell's from, which direction the wind's blowing, how strong it is, how strong the current is. All that needs to be taken into account, and then you should get a pretty good feel for just how rough it's going to be once you go out there. I can tell you the components that make it up, but only you can assess what you're comfortable with. So it does come down to a learning experience. You have to be out on the water to do it. I just want to have a look at the significant wave height and interpreting just what that means from information like the Wave Rider Boy. That's one of the things that I always check before I go out. I have a look and see what the Wave Rider Boy says it is at the moment. It doesn't give a forecast. It tells you what it has been, what it is at the moment. So if I'm going offshore, first thing I do before I hook up the boat is check the Wave Rider Boy and make sure it's still what I expect it to be from the forecast. But to understand exactly what it means, you need to understand what they mean by the significant wave height, how it's calculated, how that relates to the actual height of the waves, and I'll just talk about that briefly. Now this graph's from the Bureau of Meteorology, and it just shows the distribution of wave heights. You'll notice that the bulk of the curve is below the significant wave height, and the definition of the significant wave height is the average height of the highest one-third of waves. So that's an average. Out of that one-third, you're going to get half of that one-third, so one-sixth of waves will be higher than the significant wave height, and the other half of one-third will be lower than the significant wave height. But the significant wave height is only talking about one-third of the waves, so two-thirds of the waves are going to be much lower than the significant wave height. However, that's not the end of the story. you notice the graph goes up beyond the significant wave height to even higher waves. You all heard stories of rogue waves that tip the boat over. Well, I don't really believe in rogue waves myself. I don't think they're a thing. However, you do get some high waves. And they happen about three times a day, according to the oceanographers that study these things. That you're likely to get one of these high waves three times a day. But before I scare you too much about the maximum wave height, just have a look at the most frequent wave height compared to the significant wave height, and you'll see that at least twice as many waves will be half of the significant wave height. So if the significant wave height is 2 metres, you can expect to find most of your waves around 1 metre. But there is a chance that you might find a 4 metre wave. That's pretty intimidating in a small boat. But it depends a lot on the wave period as well. I've talked a lot about that. The longer the period, the less noticeable the swell is. Now just to summarise all this again, 
most of the waves you encounter when you go out will be about half the significant wave height. That's an average and you can think of it as ranging from zero up to the significant wave height, the average being half that. About every seventh wave is likely to be above the significant wave height. Anywhere from just above to double the height, with it being very rare to encounter one double the height. They say about three waves double the significant wave height every 24 hours. So yeah, occasionally I have been out and I've noticed that, hey, that was a big swell, what happened there? But with a significant wave period, it's not dangerous. You just say, hey, what happened? On the other hand, if the swell period is very short, then you certainly shouldn't be out there in anything other than, say, a metre significant wave height. Because even that's not going to be terribly comfortable, but it is doable. Everything's keyed on the height and the wave period. The higher the swell, the longer the wave period you need for it to be a comfortable ride. And again, it's something you have to determine, what am I comfortable with? But I can give you a rule of thumb. Now, this is a bit that I spoke about right in the intro, about my very poor drawing skills and how I was going to find it difficult to explain what I wanted to explain about how to handle these waves. I'm going to try to compensate for my drawing skills with words. I do hope I manage to explain it properly. I know what I want to say. I know what I want to illustrate to you. I found that I can't illustrate all that well. Let's hope that I can explain it better. First thing in rough water, the throttle is your friend. You'll be on and off the throttle all the time if it's really rough. By the time you get back after an hour of that, say, your arm's going to be a bit sore. It's quite exhausting. You've got to pay attention to every wave. You've got to be on and off the throttle. You'll do that going over the bar or coming back across the bar. That's only five minutes or so. But if you're in some rough water and you've got to come back for an hour, it gets very tiring. So first of all, get off the throttle when you're coming up to a big wave. Don't just leave the throttle on and launch yourself over it. I fished a couple of times with a bloke that thought it was really cool to launch off the waves. I don't know how his back handled it. I know mine wouldn't. You get quite a jar when the boat lands. Not good for your engine either because when the propeller leaves the water, your engine over revs. But he seemed to think it was cool. But have a look at these pictures. You'll see that it's not cool. It's an easy way to sink your boat. I only went out with this guy a couple of times. I wasn't in his boat, like we took two boats. He was the guy launching off the waves, and I was thinking, oh God, I hope he doesn't think. But anyway, be very careful. Get your throttle back as soon as you're coming up to a big wave. Don't risk going over the top too fast. Or you'll slam back down into the trough, or worse than that even, you might even dip your nose into the next wave. If you've got short period waves and they're close together and they're getting a bit high to be comfortable, one of the things you can do to help yourself is to cut across the waves at 45 degrees. Now that means you might have to zigzag all the way back to your home port. Now 45 degrees to the left, then change tack 90 degrees so you're travelling at 45 degrees to the waves going right. If you think about that for a second, you'll realise that you're going to use twice as much fuel to cover the same distance as the crow flies. So that's another consideration. If the waves are big and you figure you've got to tack across them to try and ease the strain on the captain and the boat and the crew, then consider your fuel, because sometimes you might just have to take the hard knocks and go straight ahead if you haven't got enough fuel. Also remember that rough weather, just by itself, is going to increase your fuel consumption because you're going up and down waves, you're not going in a straight line. So that can add 20% to your fuel consumption as well. Now, a lot of things to consider when the weather turns bad. I'll just talk about head seas for a moment, and that's when you're travelling more or less directly into the oncoming waves. A big head-on sea is always going to be tough going, but there's a few things you can do to make it just a little bit better. First of all, make sure anything heavy you've got is sitting right down on the floor. You want your centre of gravity in your boat as low as you can get it. Also, make sure the trim of your engine is fully down. That will also help. If your nose is too high, as happens if you put the trim up, your boat's going to pound a lot more. Getting the trim all the way down lets the hull cut through the waves better. 
also make sure your boat is balanced side to side so it's not leaning one way or the other. If you've got trim tabs on you can do that with trim tabs otherwise move your crew around or your load until the boat's sitting level. Being unbalanced just makes it easier for the boat to roll if you get into a bad position. Make sure any heavy gear you've got like batteries, gas tanks if you've got uh, gas bottles on board Anything like that is securely fastened down because you don't want that flying around the boat while you're concentrating on other things. If you're going through any sort of really heavy weather, then you're not going to be up on a plane. You're going to be driving a displacement boat and that makes driving it a bit harder. You're going to be on the throttle all the time. You're going to be steering all the time. You're going to be thinking about every single wave you come to. Never ever go fast enough that your prop leaves the water or cavitates. That'll let the engine over rev and may in fact break right then and there, just through over revving. There's two dangers about going over a wave too fast. Uh, one is that the nose of the boat can go too high, which will let the stern go back down first and sink your boat. The other is the nose can go too low and plough into the next wave, again sinking your boat. The trick when coming into a really steep wave, or any wave actually, but the steeper the wave is, the more important this is to get it right, and that is to slow down and let the bow have time to rise up over the wave. If you're coming up to the wave, even if the face of that wave looks almost vertical, slow right down and let the bow do its work. You don't go back into neutral, but in some seas I've been almost back into neutral. As I come up to the wave, I'll bring it right back so that I'm only just in gear. Let the boat slow, let the wave lift the nose. Then when I come down the other side, I put the power back on, ready to get onto the next wave. Backwards and forwards off the throttle all the time. So as you're coming up to the wave, slow down. You may want to take it at a little bit of an angle, just depends on the size of the wave. If the wave's really big, you're better off taking it straight on, even if it's not quite as comfortable. But if the wave isn't quite as steep and isn't quite as big, you can often make it easier by just angling into it a little bit, 10, 15, 20 degrees. You get used to that with experience. If you ever do misjudge it and your prop does cavitate or clear the water, get off the throttle immediately, even back into neutral. The last thing you want to do is let your engine over rev. If you're in rough water, the last thing you want is a broken engine. Depending on the size of your boat and the size of the waves that you're facing, you might find you're barely making headway, just a few knots. And that makes for a long trip back. Persevere at slow speed, it'll be a safe trip albeit a very exhausting one by the time you get back. The amount of concentration you need in that sort of weather, working the throttle, working the helm, it all adds to fatigue by the end of the day. I find that I'm fine while I'm battling the water, but when I get back, I just want to relax for a while. In the very, very worst weather conditions, you may have to heave to under power, and what that means is heading the boat directly into the waves keeping just enough power on to have steerage, even if you're not making any headway. Just hold your position, hold the nose of the boat into the waves and wait out the storm. If things are looking really grim, that's your last alternative. You need just enough power on so that you can steer the boat and hold the nose directly into the waves. If you've got an outboard motor, that's a lot easier, or a stern drive, that's a lot easier because you're turning the propellers with it. If you've got a boat with rudders, it makes it a bit harder. Now next I'd like to talk about beam seas. And a beam sea is when you're taking the waves side on to the boat. And they're a very special consideration as well. How much effect a beam sea has on your boat depends very much on how top heavy it is. If you've got a lot of gear up top like radars etc. That makes your boat more top heavy. It also depends on the hull design, how much freeboard you have and how wide the boat is. Now first of all, a rolling motion is credited with making people more seasick than any other motion, so just for the comfort of the captain and crew, you want to avoid rolling as much as you can. But the beam sea provides a very real danger of capsizing. 
My current boat is a 21 foot base port mono hull, and in that boat I won't take the sea beam on if the waves are any more than about 4 feet. My boat's a little over 6 feet wide, but any wave over 4 feet's uncomfortable, that's for sure. In the old wave dancer, that was a tri hull design. It was a 7 metre boat, and it had ample beam and huge freeboard. And being a tri hull design, it was extremely stable. There was no risk of capsizing that boat, taking waves beam on well in excess of six feet. But that hull design is a special case. In a mono hull boat, keep the wave height less than the width of your boat in order to stay safe and reasonably comfortable. Now again, operating a boat in a beam sea where the waves are large requires experience and constant vigilance. If you come across a larger wave in the set, you'll often need to turn the bow into it to take it more bow on to avoid rolling. Again, it's just a matter of concentration, assessing every single wave and working your helm and throttle to suit. As the wave gets bigger, again, it pays to zigzag into the waves. So first zigzag into the waves, so you're taking the wave on your bow quarter then zigzag away from the waves, so you're taking the waves on your stern quarter. Now this can make the ride a little bit more comfortable and a little bit safer, but it presents its own difficulties as well. I'll talk about them when I talk about following seas, but you need to be extra vigilant when you're zigzagging in a beam sea. A following sea is when the boat's moving in the same direction as the waves, and if the waves are only moderate, there's very little risk involved. However, if you're in a really heavy sea, then it's quite arguably one of the most dangerous positions you can be in. It requires constant attention and excellent reaction times to meet any changing situation. A good rule of thumb to get started with is that a wave height of less than one third of your boat length is all you should go out in. It's pretty much all I'll do now. I try to keep it even less than that. It's comfortable. It all depends on the period, of course. I'm not saying it's all about the height. You have to look at the period as well. But that's a reasonable starting point for you. And I would call that the significant wave height as well. Not the lower average, but the significant wave height. If it's more than one third the length of your boat, I would not be going out. With good seamanship, you can go out in much more. So best advice I can give you, pay attention to the rule of thumb. Significant wave height less than one third of your boat. And if you're doing it for the first time, you're not very experienced, make it less than one sixth of your boat. So if you've got a six metre boat, look for a significant wave height of about one metre for your first trip. Might delay you a little bit, but the day will come. On good weather, we get significant wave heights of less than a metre a lot of the time offshore here in Brisbane. I have to say that this year it hasn't happened. We're into the third month of the year now. But we do get them, so just hang about for your first trip and you'll find a really good day. If you find yourself in a following sea with large waves, try to sit on top of a wave. Not quite on top, just on the back of the wave, but up towards the crest of the wave. If you're in a planing hull, you shouldn't have any problem. Normally waves will travel 12 to 15 knots, if you're getting a very fast wave, it might be 15 to 20 knots. But if you've got a planing hull, you should be able to keep up with the wave. It requires constant attention and constant use of the throttle. But that's the safest place to be. If you end up surfing down the front of a wave, that can lead to the bow burying into the next wave. And what happens then is called pitch poling. Basically means that your boat flips end over end. The other dangerous situation is if the wave behind you catches up to you, that can lift the stern of the boat up, which pushes the bow down. The bow then creates more drag, which slows it down and creates a pivot point. So as the stern lifts up, it gets twisted sideways, pivoting on the bow that's burying in the water, and all of a sudden you side onto that wave. Now that situation where the stern of the boat swings out because the wave is pushing you around, that's called broaching. Once you've broached, it's not called broaching anymore. You're in front of the wave, you side onto it, it's called rolling. That's one of the ways you can roll your boat in a big sea. 
Again, with a planing hull, normal power boat, plenty of engine power, shouldn't be a problem. Broaching can also happen if you go over the top of the wave and end up in front of the wave you were sitting on. The extra speed you get as you go down the face of the wave can lead to what we just discussed, the pitch poling. So what you need to do as you go down the face is to back off on the throttle. And backing off on the throttle as you're going down the front of the wave can cause the stern to start to yaw and you'll end up in that broaching situation. So as soon as you feel the stern start to move, apply some steering in the same direction, the same as you would if you're in a rear wheel slide in a car. And when you get to the bottom, reapply power so that you stay in front of the wave again and climb up on the back of the next wave. Displacement vessels and planing hulls that don't have enough power are in a much more dangerous situation and the best you can do there is to apply as much power as you've got to try and stay ahead of the following wave and when the wave finally does catch up to you, cut back the power to let it pass under you as quickly as possible. If you're in that sort of boat, you're in a bad position and just have to make the best of it. It may in fact be better in some circumstances to heave to under power as we discussed earlier. Prime rule is never, 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 ever stop in a following sea. If you stop in a following sea, the wave behind you can come up and swamp your boat, particularly if it's a big one. If it's a small one, you might just get splashes in. If you keep getting splashes in, eventually your boat's going to be swamped. So rule number one, if you're in a following scene, never, never, never stop. You'll often hear a lot about not turning your boat if you're in heavy seas. However, that's not quite true in my experience. What I've found in a planing hull with an outboard or stern drive and heavy weather, it's actually quite possible to turn in heavy seas if you time it right and you execute the manoeuvre very quickly. So what I would suggest is getting up on the crest of a wave or near the crest of a wave, come up behind it, be up near the top of it. Then when you've got enough gap between you and the wave following, what you do is get the helm over and apply some power to make the turn a bit quicker and get the boat around before the next wave behind you catches up to you. The key thing is never to be broadside onto the wave when it catches you. You have to complete the turn before the wave behind you catches you. And if you do that, you'll avoid the rollover, and it's quite a feasible operation. It just takes some timing. I hope I haven't frightened anyone too much, because provided your boat is what I would call suitable for the conditions, and I don't mean going out in a little car top or tinny in heavy weather, I mean going out in a well-founded boat, chances are your boat is more seaworthy and safer than you give it credit for. It's a big subject, it depends on matching your engine size to the boat, to the hull, all sorts of factors come into account, the amount of freeboard you've got, the list is endless. But provided you've got a good boat, say any of the good brand name boats that you see getting around, and many of the not quite so well known brands are very good as well. I've been in some boats where, you know, it was kind of scary when it got even moderately rough. But good seamanship can compensate for that as well. So best advice I can give you is practice everything I've said in seas that aren't too rough. You know, try going along and holding on a wave when it's not that big that it's critical. Try turning on a wave when they're not that big that it's critical. And try all the things I've suggested in smaller seas so that you've got some confidence and experience when you run into those big seas. I've spoken a lot about the amount of concentration you need to put into driving your boat in rough conditions and moving the throttle, the steering, all of that just adds up to fatigue at the end of the trip. The further you have to go, the more fatigued you're going to be. And the more fatigued you are, the more likely you are to lose concentration and make a mistake. In rough water, your safety margins are smaller than normal and any mistake can be amplified get you into trouble quickly. Consider your options if you've got a long way to go home. Heading into it and getting fatigued before you get there might not be the best option. In that case, you may want to consider sheltering in a bay until the weather abates. 
So if you're in Moreton Bay, for instance, there's plenty of shelter around. Call into work, tell them you won't be into work the next day because you're sheltering from a storm, and wait it out. And as Forrest said, that's all I've got to say about that. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope you've got some new knowledge out of it. I hope it helps you if you ever get into some really rough conditions. I haven't covered everything there is to say. It's just a lifetime of learning. And as I just said, the best thing you can do is practice in seas that you're comfortable in so that when you get into seas that are dangerous, you at least know what to do. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. Stay safe. Until next time, good fishing.